recording. Uh, hello, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Pirasana. Thank you for joining us today for this launch and discussion of Eve Engler's new book, Stand on God for Whom? A People's History of the Canadian uh, Military. I'm a peace campaigner with the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace. Established in 1960, the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, VOW is Canada's oldest national feminist peace group. VOW is based on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. First Nations peoples in Canada have been victims of brutal atrocities inflicted by the Canadian government, especially its military. As Eves writes about in his new book, to quote an excerpt, after Confederation, the Canadian military suppressed the Métis and Indigenous peoples on the prairies and expropriated reserve territory for bases and to compensate white soldiers returning from war. So there were, there were numerous atrocities were inflicted by the Canadian settler colonial government which resulted in indigenous people losing their land and culture. It resulted in the industrialization and militarization of their land. This event has been sponsored by Val Peace and the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute as part of the No Fighter Jets Coalition. The coalition aims to put pressure on the Canadian government to cancel its plans to purchase 88 advanced fighter jets. As Eve also discusses in his new book, which I'm sure he'll go into greater detail today, Canada in the past has used fighter jets to kill innocent civilians in unjust wars. The government plans to purchase these new 88 fighter jets to replace the Royal Canadian Air Force's existing fleet of CF-18 fighter jets. Mm. The federal government claims Heavy the people. cost oh my God. of the 88 new fighter jets is 19 billion. However, the No New Fighter Jets Coalition has found that 19 billion is only the sticker price. Depending on which fighter jets the government decides to purchase, it's very likely to be Lockheed Martin's F-35. The true life cycle cost of these jets will amount to an estimated $77 billion. For more information regarding the government's plans to purchase these costly, environmentally destructive and futile fighter jets, and what our coalition is doing to stop this purchase, please visit www.nofighterjets.ca and follow us on social media. The No Fighter Jets Coalition is also planning a week of action when Parliament begins the week of November 22nd. So stay tuned for more details on that. To those in attendance today, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box and please feel free to put questions in the chat throughout this event. I would now like to introduce Tamara Lorix to speak. Tamara is a member of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and the No Fighter Jets Coalition. She's also a PhD candidate in global governance at Wilfrid Laurier University. Tamara will speak more about the work of Val Peace and the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. Good afternoon, everyone from Waterloo. This is the traditional territory of the Six Nations under the Haldeman Treaty. It's really great to be with you all on such a sunny afternoon. Um, so the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, VOW, and the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, CFPI, are very pleased to be hosting this book launch with Eve. His writing and his work are so important to us in the peace movement and Vow especially relies on his work uh, for the campaigns that we do. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the work of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, we were founded in 1960. We have members across the country. Our priorities are a feminist peace, a calling for demilitarization and disarmament. We've had a long critique of the uh, Canadian Armed Forces and the Department of National Defense. We've also been working on the issue of military sexual violence. And um, we are also a very active uh, member of the No Fighter Jets Coalition, and we are wanting a new politics of, of peace. 
Uh, we welcome new members and I will put more information about the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace in the in the chat. And we are also very pleased that our national coordinator, Vanessa, is on the call today and going to provide a rea reaction, a reflection to a Eve's book launch. And then I would also uh, like to uh, introduce to you the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. For those of you who aren't familiar with the organization, it's a much newer organization. It started about a year and a half ago. There were a few of us that came together and we launched a campaign to stop Canada from getting a seat on the UN Security Council because we are so concerned about the racism and violence of Canadian foreign policy. And we are calling for a, a nonviolent, peaceful, uh, friendly uh, relations to Canadian foreign policy. And we, we invite you to, uh, to participate in the CFPI. You can uh, check out our website and join our email list. VOW also has an email list. And we would uh, welcome you to subscribe to our email list, to follow us on social media, to uh, stay tuned to the work that we're doing on our website. And we would love for you to support our work as well, uh, to, to become a member of VOW to uh, become a subscriber of the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. And we believe that by working together, if we can uh, connect with uh, progressive Canadians, Canadians who are committed to peace, to disarmament, to uh, nonviolence, um, uh, uh, social justice, climate justice, we can work together, we can change the course of Canadian foreign policy. So um, I, I'm very um, uh, pleased again to have uh, VOW and CFPI hosting one of the very first book launches for VOW, uh, for, for Eve on his new book, Standing on Guard for Whom. And I'm going to turn it back now to Pitasana, who's going to introduce Eve. Thanks, everyone, very much for coming. Thank you, Tamara. Eve Engler is a Canadian Montreal-based writer and political activist. Eves is the author of 11 books with many of his writings having appeared in mainstream and alternative publications. Eves Engler has been dubbed one of the most important voices on the Canadian left today in the mold of I.F. Stone, a leftist gadfly, and my personal favorite, the Canadian Noam Chomsky. Eves new book is significant as it is the first book to present a history of the Canadian military from the perspective of its victims. You can buy Eve Engler's new book, Stand on Guard for Whom? A People's History of the Canadian Military on the publisher's website, www.blackrosebooks.com. That's www.blackrosebooks.com. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Eve Engler. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pitisana. Thank you, uh, uh, Tamara, Voice of Women, uh, for putting this on, uh, Vanessa and everyone else who've, uh, who've uh, uh, helped organize this. Um, I want to uh, begin by acknowledging I'm speaking to you from the traditional uh, Indigenous territory, Georgiage, uh, long a point of meeting and exchange among uh, many different uh, First Nations. Uh, I was hoping that it, we were going to have like a blizzard all across the country. It was going to be terrible weather and everyone would be uh, stuck in, indoors and, and uh, lots of people would, uh, would uh, turn out. But unfortunately here in Montreal, and I, and I understand in lots of places, it's a beautiful day. So, uh, so uh, I'm very happy for everyone who've, uh, who've taken their time to, uh, to, uh, to participate in this, in this event. Um, uh, for me, this is, I'll, I'll show, you, show you the book, uh, Stand on Guard for Whom, A People's History of the Canadian Military. It's probably the biggest book that I've done. Uh, 330 uh, pages, uh, 20 different uh, uh, chapters. I'll show you the different, uh, some of the titles and how well you can see that, uh, of the 20 different chapters on all kinds of different themes of, uh, of Canadian uh, foreign policy. Uh, of Canadian military. Um, and, and when you go, you start researching the Canadian military, it's, it's a massive field. I mean, there are, there are thousands of books dealing with Canadian uh, military history, specific elements of the military. I believe this is the first 
uh, critical overview uh, from the perspective of those who've been disenfranchised by the Canadian uh, military here uh, and abroad, um, uh, who've been dis disenfranchised by the, the wars, repression, military culture. You know, one issue that we see in the press a lot today is uh, the whole question of, of, uh, of uh, sexual assault, allegations of sexual misconduct uh, within the Canadian forces. This book, I believe, offers a little bit of a context to understanding what is really uh, uh, a, you could argue, the institutional embodiment of toxic mascul masculinity, right? Women weren't allowed into submarines until 2000. Right? There's a long history of, of uh, sexism, patriarchy within the Canadian military. And there's things, you know, the, the two worst examples of, uh, uh, of uh, patriarchal violence in Canadian history, the uh, 1989 uh, 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 Polytechnique massacre, uh, uh, the individual who did that uh, was somebody who, who tried to join the military. Uh, the same thing in 2018 with the, uh, the van attack in, uh, in Toronto that left 10 mostly women uh, dead. The individual who you know, referred to him as the incel rebellion, uh, uh, very sexist. Again, he cites his military service. It was a short military service. Uh, there is a connection. Uh, and I think that we're seeing some of that played out, play out in the dominant media right now. But I don't think that they're going to uh, to the sort of root of uh, of some of what what's going on with the uh, 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 sexual misconduct or sexual assault within the, uh, the military. Also, another issue that's playing out in the media a bit to a slightly lesser extent is the whole uh, far right forces uh, activists joining the military, and what is it about the military that appeals to these far, far right activists? And there's been a whole number of stories over the past four or five years of these far right activists uh, joining the military, being part of the military, uh, finding out that uh, one of the right wing groups here in Montreal, that is disproportionate number of members or organizers are from the military. Um, they're attracted to this authoritarian institution, an institution that, that it wasn't that long ago actually had a policy uh, of only accepting people of quote, pure European descent and of the white race. Right until after World War II, uh, a very explicit institutional top-down racism within the Canadian military. So I hope this book also provides a little bit of uh, context to making sense of some of the issues that were were being discussed uh, in the dominant media around uh, around the, the 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 military. So. The Canadian Forces, the Department of National Defense, is the largest federal government department. Uh, we're talking about 70,000 active soldiers, 30,000 reservists, and 25,000 uh, Department of National Defense employees. Uh, it has a budget of about $24 billion. Uh, and then on top of that, you have Veterans Affairs, which has a budget uh, above $5 billion, uh, that also has about 4,000 employees. So this is something in the range of 15 times the budget of Environment and Climate Change Canada, right? This is a massive institution. Um, DND manages the largest infrastructure portfolio in the federal government, uh, over 20,000 buildings, 5,500 kilometers of road, 3,000 kilometers of waterworks, uh, about 2 million hectares, which is, half the land, more than half the land in Switzerland. That is, that is uh, the Department of National Defense uh, overseas. About 50 uh, frigates, submarines, other vessels, 400 aircraft, tens of thousands of land vehicles. And all these vehicles like the fighter jets, the naval vessels, the different uh, land vehicles, they emit incredible amounts of fossil fuels. Uh, as well as the buildings. Uh, in 2019-2020, in the Department of National Defense was responsible for 59% of government greenhouse gas emissions. But the Trudeau government in its net zero plan excludes the military. So responsible for about 60% of, of uh, all federal government greenhouse gas emissions is excluded from their supposedly ambitious 
uh, uh, net zero uh, uh, plan. Also, the military vessels regularly um, uh, spill oil into the into the sea, into different waterways. Uh, incredible amounts of of, of uh, destruction of of bases through ordnance uh, and, and other uh, activities that take place on uh, 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 military bases. So it's incredibly ecological, uh, anti-ecological institution, as well as warfare itself being uh, responsible for all kinds of uh, destruction of ecosystems. And I go into that um, uh, uh, somewhat extensively in, in, in the book. In terms of the understanding the scope of the military, uh, it has the only federally government federal government degree granting institution, university run by the federal government. So the Royal Military College in Kingston, uh, it operates two, do two dozen specialized education facilities like the Canadian Forces School of Meteorology or the Royal Canadian Electrical and Mechanical Engineers School. The military has the largest public relations apparatus in this country. Hundreds and hundreds of full-time employees paid by the taxpayer uh, to basically promote the military, to promote the military's perspective on international affairs, on all different kinds of uh, uh, public uh, affairs. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to get an exact estimate, but some estimates put it as high as 600 uh, uh, full-time employees working in public relations for the Canadian uh, uh, military. The military is also the uh, largest intelligence gathering apparatus in the country, right? Thousands and thousands of intelligence officials. You have the communication security establishment, which is under the Department of National Defense. It has 2,700 employees and a $700 million budget. And then you have a whole bunch of other uh, um, uh, military uh, intelligence uh, uh, entities that are uh, thousands, uh, have thousands of employees. Uh, and and, um, and, and in recent, recent reports have, have discussed how the military has, has um, spied on uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, I Don't Know More. Uh, there's been a whole bunch of reporting from uh, David Puglesi, an Ottawa citizen, recently about all the, um, all the spying that the military has been doing with regards to uh, uh, the, uh, or should I say intelligence gathering with regards to the pandemic and a worry early in the pandemic that there may, it might lead to, to like political disturbances. And they've done all kinds of really uh, intense uh, um, uh, intelligence gathering uh, uh, techniques and, and, and spying on basically on, on Canadians uh, out of worry that that there might be some sort of political uh, 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 backlash amidst the uh, the pandemic. So it's a massive institution. The Canadian military is a massive, massive institution, and it's really hard to get a head around just exactly how big it is. Um, and uh, and uh, but it but it really is, and, it, and I think it's underexplored just how significant of an institution it is. The roots of the Canadian military are the British military. I mean, the force that uh, obviously conquered what we what we call Canada uh, today, Turtle Island, uh, the um, force that helped uh, obviously dispossess Indigenous people uh, throughout much of what we call uh, uh, Canada today. And, and a force that helped conquer all you know, parts all around the world, right? The British Empire was this massive um, uh, entity that, uh, that the, the Canadian military or the roots of the early phases of the Canadian military uh, 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 come from. So for instance, the Royal Military College uh, in Kingston, Ontario, uh, was set up in 1876 to uh, train uh, proper white, white gentlemen, as one uh, author put it, uh, to be officers of British uh, imperialism. So there were Canadians trained at Royal Military College, usually trained by British uh, uh, officers, uh, that, that became um, officers of, of, uh, of British forces conquering 
Ghana, Nigeria, uh, Afghanistan, uh, uh, parts of India, uh, uh, fighting in wars there. Uh, uh, they basically all around the world, you had Canadians trained at the Royal Military College being officers of, uh, of British uh, imperialism in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s. And uh, so that's the roots of the Canadian military. The other part of the Canadian military, and I go into it uh, in, in the book in a chapter, uh, early roots are, are of um, the militia was really an entity. So, so on one hand, it was the military was about disp dispossessing indigenous people. The other part, it was a, a uh, um, the militia was really about uh, class rule. And, and uh, between 1867 and 1933, the militia is sent out to uh, repress about 70 different strikes, right? Uh, so they, they uh, and often violently repress uh, strikes happen, happening all across, uh, all across the country. So, so early on, it was really just a, the militia was really a tool of, uh, of the bosses uh, when people were fighting for, a, you know, a, an eight hour work day or, or minimum wage or, or, or recognition of unions at a time when unions were, were largely illegal. Um, so that's the early roots of, 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 of the Canadian, uh, part of the Canadian military as being tied to the British Empire, extending the British Empire, and, uh, and also uh, uh, being a tool of, uh, of the bosses. Um, in the book, I go through a history of, of, uh, of Canadian warfare, and I'm gonna to try to do it a quick uh, rundown, maybe like a five minute uh, history, critical history of Canadian uh, warfare, uh, beginning with the Canadians, about 400 Canadians that were dispatched to uh, Sudan uh, to help the British uh, keep control of Khartoum in, uh, in 1884. That was a, uh, it was ultimately unsuccessful uh, effort, uh, but Canadians helped in, uh, in enabling a whole bunch of different horrible uh, massacres where hundreds and hundreds uh, into the thousands of, of Sudanese uh, were, were, were killed by, uh, by British forces. Uh, in the late 1800s, 1899 to 1902, uh, you have uh, 7,000 Canadians who are sent to South Africa uh, to help the, uh, the British uh, um, maintain control of South Africa uh, in, in a context where the, the Boer uh, states uh, were, were kind of developing an economic independence from the British uh, coastal uh, 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 states. And, uh, and the Boer War was a quite a brutal affair. Uh, about uh, 20,000 uh, Boer, mostly women and children, were killed in, in concentration camps. Uh, about an equal number of, of, of Africans were, were, were killed, uh, though we didn't, they didn't actually keep the numbers for the Africans killed, so we don't know exactly. Um, and it was really about the British uh, uh, keeping control of an important shipping route to India, to a very profitable colony in India, and about British mining interests wanting to get at uh, significant uh, uh, minerals. World War I, something like 400,000 Canadians uh, fought in a completely uh, uh, destructive and absurd war uh, that left uh, you know, millions, uh, millions dead. It was really the, the the end of the uh, British or the, the European scramble for Africa, that's part of what propelled World War I. It's all, it also uh, uh, in, uh, continued on during the war with Canadians helping the British uh, take control over uh, parts of uh, West, Afri West Africa, parts of East Africa uh, from, from the Germans. Uh, during World War I, uh, Canadians also garrisoned British colonies in, uh, in, the, in the Caribbean. Um, so World War I was, uh, was in many ways a, um, an extending of and continuing of, uh, of, uh, of British uh, colonial rule and Canada supporting British colonial rule. During World War II, about a million Canadians fought. Um, uh, 
similarly, they fought in, uh, in different parts of Africa, North Africa and Ghana, uh, uh, reinforced uh, British uh, rule in, uh, in Africa, but also in Asia, uh, helping the, I mean, the infamous Canadians being sent to Hong, Hong Kong, uh, a couple thousand Canadian troops being sent to Hong Kong to try to maintain Hong Kong as a British uh, colony uh, that turned into a big uh, uh, disaster. Um, and then, and then towards the end of World War II, helping to reestablish uh, British colonial rule uh, in many parts of, uh, of, of, of Asia. And again, during World War II, Canadians garrisoned uh, a number of the British colonies in, in, the, uh, in the Caribbean. During the Korean War of 1950 to 1953, about 27,000 uh, Canadians uh, fought uh, in a war that left uh, three, four million people dead. At one point, the Americans stopped bombing North Korea because all buildings of more than two stories had been destroyed. And, uh, and what the war was about was partly the fact that the, uh, the Chinese had their uh, nationalist communist revolution the year before where Mao's forces uh, won uh, in 1949. And also it was actually a justification for, for, for uh, military Keynesianism to justify uh, post-World War II, there was a, there was a recession uh, with the end of obviously World War II helped get out of the, the Great Depression. And then after the war, the, the uh, reduction of, of spending on the military uh, became a bit of a problem uh, from the standpoint of, uh, of uh, capitalist boom and, boom and busts. Um, and there was a recession. And so the Korean War justified a real uh, rearmament um, uh, both uh, here and also actually with regards to NATO and, and, and sending troops to uh, 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 Western Europe, um, uh, which is kind of a weird, uh, weird story, but I won't, I won't get into. But, but basically, so World War, or it's the Korean War, partly about China, partly about rearmament, left three to four million uh, people dead, uh, a horrible, horrible war that really gets, to, deserves a whole lot more attention um, uh, than it gets. In the first Iraq war, in the early 1990s, uh, 4,000 Canadians fought in what Mark Curtis referred to as the open rehabilitation of colonialism and imperialism in the Middle East. Um, uh, it was incredibly destructive. Tens of thousands uh, died in Iraq. Uh, uh, obviously the pretext was, uh, was, uh, was Kuwait and Iraq taking, taking control of, of Kuwait. Um, uh, but it appears that Saddam Hussein thought he had a, had a green light from, from the Americans to do that. And, and um, the Canadian bombing and, and coalition bombing went way beyond just uh, expelling Iraqi forces uh, uh, from, um, uh, from, uh, from Kuwait. And uh, it actually is kind of the, somewhat of the roots of, of what we've you know, gone on now for the past uh, uh, 30 plus years of, uh, of war and destruction uh, in, in, in Iraq and uh, a little bit throughout the, uh, throughout the region. Uh, in the late 1990s, Canadian fighter jets uh, dropped 530 bombs on the former Yugoslavia and uh, uh, 18 Canadian fighter jets were there. And this was about really NATO asserting itself uh, post uh, end of the Cold War, find, trying to figure out a justification. Uh, also about uh, pressing a uh, private, privatization agenda uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, breaking up uh, the last bits of the, uh, the former, uh, the former uh, uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, a couple of years later, Canadians uh, invaded uh, Afghanistan, Canadians got the forces. Uh, and then a, uh, a larger invasion uh, a little bit later on after 2001, uh, 40,000 Canadians fought in Afghanistan. And, uh, and as we're seeing play out in, in you know, recent weeks and uh, it, for what, what was the purpose of all this uh, uh, warfare? The Taliban is back. Now you have a situation where you have even more extremist uh, 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 ISIS Rather than uh, rather than Al Qaeda, uh, you have rise of even more uh, sort of fanatical um, uh, groups, uh, and uh, and uh, Canada, you know, sent forty thousand troops, uh, uh, occupied the country for uh, was there for about thirteen years, 
of, uh, of warfare. And it's really hard to, 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 to figure out what, what that was all about. Um, in 2011, uh, in Libya, the Canadian general led a NATO bombing campaign of, uh, of, uh, of Libya. Uh, the African Union uh, worked aggressively, hard to try to avoid conflict, uh, uh, sought negotiation, uh, because the African Union was concerned that the, the war would destabilize not only Libya, but would destabilize much of the Sahel region uh, of Africa. Um, and that's exactly what it did, right? The war spilled uh, south into Mali and even all the way from, from coast to coast, uh, from Boko Haram in, uh, in Nigeria to uh, Al-Shabaab in, in, uh, in uh, Somalia, you find that the weaponry and, and, and some of the destabilization uh, um, uh, percolated uh, to, to those uh, to you know, all across the Sahel region. And when Canada sent troops to Mali a couple years ago, uh, in part, that was to deal with the problem that we had helped create with the, uh, with the bombing campaign in, uh, in, in, in Libya. You also had Canadian special forces on the ground there. And, uh, and, and the Canadian government knew beforehand that the, the, uh, the likely, they had intelligence reports saying that the likely uh, result of the fighting would be to uh, have a civil war that went on, which of course is what happened. It seems to have mostly, seems to have been somewhat stabilizing today, but more than a decade later, uh, you continue to have a sort of civil, civil conflict. And C Canadian officials had understood this very clearly that in the east of Libya, there were, it was uh, jihadist type groups. And, and that was who we were effectively uh, supporting to the point where uh, David Puglesi, the Ottawa Citizen reporter, quoted Canadian Air Force, who said they were Al Qaeda's uh, Air Force. That's how they viewed this. And they joked about that. Canadian uh, fighter pilots joked about that. Um, and and uh, and that instability has really uh, uh, continued on. My reading of Canadian military history is that there, of the nine wars, only one. And there's others you could count as war and get into which ones are wars and not exactly, but there's only one that you can make any real case was morally justifiable, and that's World War II. Of course, there were all kinds of things that Canada was involved with before World War II that enabled uh, you know, Hitler and Mussolini to do what they did, to enable the Japanese uh, fascists to to you know wage war in China and 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 basically precipitate uh, the war uh, or begin the war um, and uh, you know everything from the Spanish Civil War Canada basically if indirectly uh, siding with uh, Franco and Mussolini and Hitler in Spain uh, providing all kinds of uh, minerals and 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 uh, and the like to the Japanese. Um, so there's all kinds of things we could have done differently that would have led, likely led, less, made it less likely to go to war in World War II. But once the situation was where it was in the late uh, 30s, uh, obviously defeating, defeating Hitler was, um, was, a, uh, was a good thing. But uh, so only one of the wars you could even make a case that was, that it was, uh, that was morally uh, uh, justifiable. Um, <clears throat> so bringing us forward to today, we're not at a time where Canada's uh, officially at war. Uh, but nonetheless, the Canadian military is, is a, a bit all around the world, right? There's about two dozen missions that Canadian military is part of. Uh, most of them are smaller, but a number of them are fairly significant. Like in, in, in Latvia, 500 plus Canadian troops lead a NATO uh, mission in Latvia on Russia's border. Uh, you have a couple hundred Canadian troops in the Ukraine uh, supporting the uh, government that's in a conflict uh, in the east of the country. Uh, you have Canadian troops in, in, in Iraq. Uh, they've been, been part of two different missions in Iraq, one just with the U.S. and another uh, through, uh, uh, through NATO. Uh, a couple hundred uh, uh, up to 500 Canadian troops in Iraq or, and or uh, um, uh, troops in Kuwait supporting those who are in Iraq. Uh, 
you have smaller missions, quite controversial, should be quite controversial uh, missions like in the West Bank, a couple dozen Canadian troops that are basically supporting a uh, force to uh, uh, supporting a Palestinian force that's basically under the thumb of the Israelis to in enable the occupation uh, in the West Bank. Um, and you have Canadian troops in a whole bunch of other missions. You have, you know, small numbers of Canadian troops in Saudi Arabia helping the, the Americans out there. Uh, many uh, uh, missions around the world at a time, again, when we're not uh, supposed to be at war. The Canadian government has been part, uh, has been working, the Canadian military has been working to set up a uh, basis around the world. This goes back about a decade and they've set up th at least three of them. It's all quite hidden. They're small bases in Kuwait, Senegal, and Jamaica. The plan was to go up to seven bases. Uh, one that discusses is in Singapore, another has been discussed in Tanzania, in the east of east coast of Africa, one on the west coast, one on the east coast. Um, and uh, uh, it's about it's about openly, according to internal government documents, about uh, uh, to project to project combat power, as they put it, under U.S. leadership. So it's very much tied to uh, uh, U.S. Uh, military uh, policy. Similarly, Canadian naval vessels are all around the world, different, different uh, uh, patrolling the world seas, Mediterranean, North Sea. Uh, a couple of days ago, the, uh, the, the, the Chinese government criticized a Canadian and American uh, uh, naval vessels that went through the T Taiwan Strait. Um, uh, they've been running provocative maneuvers uh, in in the region that that are that are viewed as uh, very hostile by by uh, by uh, by Beijing. Uh, and there's a whole history of Canadian gunboat diplomacy. I have a section, a chapter in the book called Canadian Gun Gunboat Diplomacy, and it goes back. Um, uh, you know, probably the most egregious example is in uh, 1921 in uh, in uh, in uh, Costa Rica. So uh, a couple of years earlier, the Royal Bank of Canada had loaned money to a, a Costa Rican uh, uh, a dictator just as he was about to flee, knowing there was you know already major protests, knowing he was highly corrupt, and he basically stole the money, took it with him when he when he left the country. And the new government said, no, this is an odious debt. We're not going to pay this debt back. Uh, we didn't, you know, the people didn't see the money. We're not going to pay it back. And the Canadian government sent gunboats to pressure the Costa Rican government to pay back uh, Royal Bank, to negotiate uh, uh, with Royal Bank over, over, over the matter. And there's many examples uh, up, up until today uh, around Haiti, repeatedly sending uh, naval vessels off the coast of Haiti to, to pressure government uh, there. Uh, the book also has a section on the special forces and the Canadian Special Forces Command uh, uh, is a, a growing part, began in the early 1990s, is a growing part of the military. It's uh, about, I think it's around 2,500. We don't, it's all secretive, so we don't know exactly. Um, uh, the the uh, most important part of that is the Joint Task Force Two. That's the 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 elite of the elite of Canadian uh, uh, soldiers, and and from the government's perspective and the military's perspective, part of what makes them appealing, the special forces, is it's all secretive, right? So we don't know where they're being deployed. They don't need to. They don't need to you know tell anybody where they're being deployed. Um, and so they sometimes they leak the information. Sometimes they want to to uh, uh, have you know sort of uh, what they perceive as as a, a good uh, public relations about the about the special forces. But we but we don't know. Uh, a couple examples that that we do know about that that got reported on is uh, you know in, in February um, in Port-au-Prince uh, there was major demonstrations against uh, Jovenel Moïse, was a, a strike, a general strike, uh, February 2019. The Haiti Information Project filmed uh, a handful of Canadian Special Forces at the Toussaint Louverture Airport in plain clothes. Um, the speculation of the Haiti Information Project was that that they were were uh, helping Jovenel Moïse's the uh, um, the corrupt and repressive president, helping his family out of the country. Though I, there's no uh, 
way to confirm whether that's true or not. Um, I reported on this at the time, but none of the corporate media uh, picked the story up. Uh, in two, 2004, when they overthrew, um, when US Marines took the elected president, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, uh, out of his house in the middle of the night, put him on a plane and dumped him in the Central African Republic, there were Canadian special forces uh, at the Toussaint Louverture airport in Port-au-Prince uh, that were overseeing the airport, securing the airport. Uh, so Canadian special forces, uh, they had entered Haiti a few days earlier, uh, seem to have uh, helped in, in the, uh, this, uh, this uh, coup against uh, an elected, uh, elected government. Uh, in Libya in 2011, even though the UN resolution were really clear that there could be no foreign troops in Libya, there were a number of reports suggest there were Canadian uh, troops, special forces on the ground, uh, obviously in Afghanistan, more recently in Iraq, Syria, uh, a whole bunch of examples that have been mentioned in different books, uh, different parts of Africa, in the Congo, uh, Central African Republic, uh, Colombia, uh, uh, Peru, um, Canadian Special Forces, uh, these, these stories of, of being involved in these missions, uh, almost with no media attention, uh, but, but, uh, but highly, uh, highly political. Um, uh, so there's a section in the book about the, the history of Canadian Special Forces. There's, <clears throat> there's also a section in the book about uh, biological weapons, chemical weapons, and Canada's role in, um, in uh, uh, testing, uh, making some of these weapons, uh, uh, coming up with a shellfish, shellfish uh, toxin, uh, uh, that was uh, with Americans uh, that the, it, it may have been uh, a, used in an attempt on uh, uh, Fidel Castro's uh, life. Uh, mustard gas, anthrax, Agent Orange, all tested or, or produced or uh, on different Canadian uh, 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 military installations. And that goes all the way back to World War One. So this whole history of Canadian testing, military testing of chemical and biological weapons that, that is really, uh, it's reported on a number of books, um, uh, but, it's, but it's, it's a highly sensitive uh, political subject that, uh, that the military and the government have, have gone to great lengths to, uh, to uh, 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 clamp down on. Also, there's a history of, of uh, Canada's history in, in, uh, in, with regards to nuclear weapons. That I that I go into and Canada's role in the uh, the uh, the Quebec agreements between the British and Americans that ultimately uh, led to the uh, the bombings of uh, nuclear weapons dropped on uh, on Japan and uh, and a long history of Canada having uh, U.S. nuclear weapons on its fighter jets in Europe also obviously U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons stationed here in Canada uh, missiles on their missiles. Uh, into the 19 into the into the 1980s, um, and then also Canada's policy on nuclear weapons right up to today, where the Canadian government refuses. Uh, you know, it's part of this NATO alliance that's a, a nuclear alliance, and it it refuses to uh, to support things like the the uh, treaty on the prohibition of of, of, of nuclear weapons. Um, <clears throat> Another, another uh, section of the book is, is looks at some of the economic and, and technological elements that come out of the military. I, I think it's a, it would be a mistake um, for peace and anti-war forces to not understand the role the military has played in terms of uh, subsidizing technological advancement. Um, it's not the form of public support for uh, technological uh, change that I think should happen, but it has actually been uh, fairly successful, right? So the, the initial computers in Canada uh, are, that's Canadian Department of Research uh, Report, right? okay. yeah. uh, uh, funding, DRB, uh, the DRB uh, Defense, Research, Defense Research Board, should I say, uh, funding. So the book, the, the Computer Revolution in Canada, uh, 
it explains, quote, it was the invisible hand of Canadian military enterprise that incited companies such as Ferranti Canada, Computer, Computing Devices of Canada, Canadian Aviation Electronics, RCA Victor and Canadian Mar Marconi to increase their competence in digital electronics, right? It was public funding via the military that, that is what brought the first computers uh, into this country and a whole host of other uh, 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 advancements, uh, technological advancements, so, some of which, some of which have had, you know, are socially useful. Some of which are designed to, you know, to kill people and to to destroy things. Um, but there is a a important economic element to the military. Uh, you know, it's not as important today as it was. 70 years ago, you know, in the, right after World War II, but it continues to be a, a significant way in which the military uh, subsidizes uh, uh, corporate uh, research spending. That's a, it's a, a way of socializing the costs of, uh, of, uh, of research work. And obviously, uh, if you look at the aviation sector, the shipbuilding sector, um, <clears throat> everything to do with space, all those industries have huge, received huge amounts of public funding, uh, uh, in, in a, you know, directly in terms of the purchasing of the of the you know of contracting those companies, but also uh, just uh, different forms of of of, um, of grants and, and 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 low uh, low interest loans uh, to to directly subsidize those 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 firms. So so there's a, there's an important. Um, a, a economic part of understanding uh, the military. Also, the Canadian government uh, works really aggressively to promote military sales abroad, provides trade commissioner services to, to military companies, provides uh, diplomatic support to, to military sales. Uh, com the Canadian Commercial Corporation is a crown corporation that is in large part just designed to enable uh, foreign military sales by Canadian companies. Uh, Export Development Canada, uh, the military itself, the oftentimes naval vessels will, uh, Canadian naval vessels will go to uh, to where there's an arms uh, uh, exhibit going on. So in the UAE, in recent years, UAE at the uh, the IDEX forum, Canadian naval vessel will go there and, and so it's a way of kind of promoting the Canadian brand in, in military equipment. Um, uh, so the so the military is this is is a powerful institution. It's well integrated within the corporate sector in terms of uh, profits, you know, contracts that are profitable for, for for to military companies. But also the the military has worked hard for more than a century of of bringing leading uh, capitalists, making them honorary or, or colonels, or making them honorary positions. Um, uh, within within the military and 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 bringing them uh, the the whole corporate uh, uh, class uh, uh, close to the military, even those who are not directly profiting from military contracts, um, making them understand the importance that military spending has played in in technological advancement, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So now to uh, to conclude, what do we do, right? Um, <clears throat> I think we need to be uh, honest with ourselves that we uh, have to uh, confront uh, the military's immense cultural, political, and economic influence uh, directly. Uh, there are innumerable ways that that needs to happen. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's about, I think, re rekindling uh, anti-war activism. Uh, uh, we should talk about uh, defunding the military uh, and what that means. It's obviously not something that happens overnight, but but uh, steadily uh, cutting uh, military uh, uh, spending. Um, uh, opinion polls on the military, uh, on public perception of the military, are quite interesting. The the public has usually has a fairly positive attitude towards. The military polls show, from the institution standpoint, but they they um, they have it's very low priority. So if you ask people what they want to see public money spent on, the military is almost always at the bottom of the list. 
If you ask people what they want, uh, what their you know priorities are for their you know political whatever, again, military is at the bottom. You know, jobs, the economy, healthcare, daycare, things like that would all would, would almost always be higher on the list. Um, also, if you ask people about what they want the military to do, they don't generally want uh, the 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 priorities of of the public are the are inverse with the priorities of the military command. So the military command wants the military to fight in NATO and US led wars. Uh, the public wants the military to engage in disaster relief, uh, uh, protect borders, uh, uh, and maybe involved in peacekeeping. Uh, and very few Canadians want um, the military to be involved in, in, in uh, offensive uh, uh, wars when, when asked about it. Um, so, the, so there's so there's so there's there's room there even right now without you know significant popular education there's room now room there to you know uh, convince the public or to mobilize the public to be to uh, to challenge elements of of, uh, of military uh, policy. One obviously uh, the no fighter jet coalition that's uh, <clears throat> involved in sponsoring this event. That is a very important campaign. The first step to defunding is to not spend huge amounts of new resources on uh, uh, on fighter jets to be that really the only purpose is to is to engage in um, U.S. or NATO led wars. I mean, they, you can't help with what with what happened in Lytton, B.C. A forest fire. Uh, fighter jets are useless. Uh, with regards to the lockdown that the public that we've been facing for you know a year and a half and people's lives being disrupted by a pandemic, these fighter jets are completely useless. They provide no security uh, to deal with these pressing security issues we have, like the climate crisis that you know killed 600 people in BC and wiped out the town after three days of the hottest recorded record uh, or temperature on record in Canada and wipe out the town. Fighters just can't help us with that. Um, they can only be, they're really only useful for uh, for bombing in NATO and, and US uh, uh, led wars. Um, so these are the campaigns that, 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 that need to be engaged with um, to, uh, uh, if we want to uh, lessen the power of the military uh, over uh, Canadian uh, society. Uh, and also, if we want to um, uh, lessen the ability of the uh, government and the military to uh, to be deployed abroad in, in, in aggressive uh, wars, um, and I'll, I think I'll just uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, for for listening to me. Thank you, Eves, for uh, sharing with us uh, many of the very Im important uh, information in your book. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Vanessa Lantigny. Vanessa has worked in a variety of roles in nonprofits, as well as in the education, environmental, and human rights fields. Vanessa is the national coordinator of the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace, and she will give her thoughts regarding what Eves has discussed today about the history of Canada's military. Thanks, Fidesana. And I'd also like to extend a big thank you to Eves for joining us today to discuss his 11th book and the launch of Standing on Guard for Whom. Um, I will say that uh, it's, it's giving me hope that this book is being released because one thing that I do encounter very often as my role as national coordinator for the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace is this per pervasive idea of um, Canadian peacekeeping. And it, it, it is like a mythology and it is very hard to get people to understand um, the, the violent and aggressive history of the Canadian military. So I am really excited about this book. And I'm also excited for all the people that are joining us here today, um, because you know, with my work in BOW, uh, we try to engage as many people as possible. And what I see Eve's trying to do explicitly is shed a light on this um, uh, Canadian militarism, because we are a part of the No Fighter Jets Coalition, where we intend to stop the purchase of 88 fighter jets with an initial cost of 
19 billion dollars but in a life cycle cost of 77 billion dollars we also protest CANSEC, which is North America's largest weapons trade show, and we also protest RIMPAC, which is the largest maritime military exercise. But when I speak to nearly anyone about it, they have no clue about Canada purchasing fighter jets or who we have bombed in the past with fighter jets. They don't know about us hosting weapons trade fairs or participating in military war games. And so I did want to, to if I can jump the gun a little bit on the Q&A portion, um, so to speak. Um, I wanted to ask Eves, um, how do you think we can lift the blinders so that Canadians can see militarism as a problem? And are there any opportunities coming up that you think that we can try to push the anti-war and non-violence envelope, especially since we did just have a recent election? Is there an opportunity there to try to bring an anti-war foreign policy to the forefront? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that the election ended up being very disappointing on that front. Um, I, I actually, that was one issue. I, I thought that the fighter jets might get uh, onto the table because, um, of course, the there was a public letter launched, signed by many prominent people, opposing the fighter jet purchase just before the election, and that actually got a, a you know a decent amount of corporate media attention. Uh, so I would say a surprising uh, uh, amount of corporate media attention. And, uh, and, uh, but the NDP uh, uh, stated they, that they supported the fighter jet purchase basically explicitly. Even the Greens, uh, there were Green candidates uh, uh, that, that raised the issue and tried to uh, 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 embarrass the NDP from the, from the left uh, on, on the fighter jet issue. I saw like in um, Avi Lewis, who was running there in Whistler, uh, um, Whistler Ski to, Sea to Sky or whatever it's called, just outside of Vancouver, writing. Um, and uh, and uh, they, uh, um, they, he was criticized that the you know, NDP is supporting this huge uh, fighter jet purchase. Um, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I think that they're, 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 the answer is just, it, it's work, right? And it's uh, the fight, No Fighter Jet Coalition has uh, while it's obviously far from where we would want it to be, it has done a whole bunch of really good work over the past uh, year and a bit on the issue and has uh, politicized the issue much more than, you know, it would have so just gone under the radar. Um, uh, so I think it is on the agenda, certainly on the agenda of, 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 of some of the left, but it hasn't hit the point where, where you know, even the NDP, I mean, the NDP has a, has a, uh, uh, military critic, uh, Randall Garrison, who's extremely pro-military. Uh, so, so I think there are many NDP MPs that are, that are, that are sympathetic. Um, uh, and there, are, there were green MPs also uh, that were sympathetic to the no fighter jet position. But uh, unfortunately, Anime Paul, the, the leader of the Greens was you know, quite, quite conservative on foreign policy issues. Um, but so, so the answer is, I mean, it's just, it's work. I mean, the, the, you know, when, when the, when the uh, media establishment is is uh, is so uh, um, hostile on uh, uh, and the, the political establishment hostile. You have to be disruptive, right? I, I think I think you have to be more. Uh, there needs to be more sort of disruptive kind of actions that 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 um, that challenge. Uh, you know, maybe occupy some MPs' offices. Uh, uh, you know, disrupt public meetings where they're where they're speaking. There's there's. Um, it's uh, it, it, you know there obviously all the campaigning and the the, the public uh, education of 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 how the uh, how fighter jets have been used is really important. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think there also needs to be um, um, sort of uh, maybe more bold kind of actions uh, uh, taken. Shoot! So you're not saying there's a an easy magic formula for this. <laughs> um, Yes, I, I agree. We, we do need to sort of look at the MPs that are cracking there, that are breaking ranks and try to put pressure um, because it is a really important issue. Like I said, 19 billion is the initial price tag with 77 billion over their life cycle. Um, we also have another huge, uh, the largest procurement in Canadian history, which is also the warships. And Eves, I know you wrote about this. Um, and over the life cycle of the 
uh, the fighter jets and the warships, it's going to be around $350 billion. So each one of us has a huge stake um, in these procurements because it, they're going to eat up an enormous amount of public funds. Um, but I do want to go back to the election and uh, the new-ish government, although it is quite quite very much the status quo. Um, Justin Trudeau has purported to be a, a feminist government and there is this long awaited uh, feminist foreign policy that he has talked about. I know Bao uh, submitted uh, to Global Affairs Canada what we think a feminist foreign policy should be. I just wanted to know your thoughts about what, what it might be, but then what you think the government might actually produce and whether or not that will that will actually check the box of being a feminist foreign policy. Yeah, the, the feminist foreign policy is, is their second uh, rhetorical tool, right? So the top rhetorical tool over the past four years since Christian Freeland became uh, a foreign affairs, mini uh, foreign affairs minister, uh, global affairs Canada minister, um, was, was uh, international rules-based order. That's how she tried to market uh, the government's been marketing its foreign policy. And then this, this secondary marketing has been a feminist foreign policy. Um, there's major holes, of course, to, to that. The, you know, obvious ones being, well, you're selling $14 billion of light armored vehicles to maybe the most patriarchal uh, uh, government in the world, the Saudi monarchy. Uh, you're, you're, you know, the people looked at the whole, the, t the treaty for prohibition of nuclear weapons and, and how, uh, you know, that the real feminist foreign policy would, would, would push to, to uh, get rid of nuclear weapons. Um, one example that it, just to give you a sense of, of you know, I, I think that the, the aid policy, uh, the aid feminist policy, uh, I forget the exact name of it, international uh, feminist aid policy, but I forget the, the term they use, um, is, is uh, which is about making uh, a greater proportion of the aid budget focused on, on uh, what are deemed as, as, as feminist uh, initiatives. And I think that's a good thing. I think that, that, that how that plays out at the macro level, this is just, this is just marketing, right? At the, at the level of the ministers of the government, this is just marketing. At the level of people lower down in the Global Affairs Canada uh, uh, bureaucracy, they actually take it seriously, and they do, I think, would you know try to channel money in ways that that really, you know, are you know feministic, uh, if you like. Um, but just to, to 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 put a little pause on that, you know, in about uh, two years ago now, they gave twelve million dollars to the Haitian police that was dubbed a feminist aid policy. If you can give $12 million to the Haitian police amidst this government that's faced massive protests, general strikes, highly uh, questionable legitimacy, highly repressive, highly corrupt, and you can frame your support of the police force as, as feminist, you can frame almost anything as feminist from, a, from an aid policy perspective. And I'm pretty confident if you go through uh, all of the, the different contracts uh, that are deemed feminist of aid policy, you'll find that there are many of them that are not, um, that it, it's pretty hard to, to uh, take that, that, term, uh, that term seriously. So, so I think you know, it's, it's marketing from the government's perspective how it plays out in practice in, in, at, at, at a lower down level, oftentimes I think, you know, we're, that's, that's, it's good, um, but, but, but overwhelmingly it's, it's marketing. Thanks, Eves. And uh, I'll just wrap up by saying uh, how great it has been to, to have you on here, especially as the United Nations is celebrating the uh, United Nations Disarmament Week, uh, which starts today. So that uh, this is very topical, and with the uh, COP26 coming up very soon, your mention about how uh, military carbon emissions are not included in the greenhouse gas reduction targets, um, it's really critical that we take a very long look at the military and all of the harms that have come from it and identify it as a problem so that we can start um, deconstructing it and working towards a better, better world for all. Um, so I will let other people uh, uh, ask some questions now and not uh, take all the time. So I will hand it over to my coworker, Pitasana. 
Thank you, Vanessa and Eves. Uh, so now we'll uh, move over to our Q&A discussion portion. Uh, if people still have any uh, questions or uh, comments, please put them in the, in the chat below. Our uh, first uh, comment slash question comes from Ken Stone. Uh, Ken, if you'd like to unmute yourself and uh, ask uh, and, uh, and say your comment to Eves, uh, and also if you'd like to say anything about the, the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. Thanks very much, Peter Sana. Uh, I'd like to congratulate Eves on his excellent and thorough presentation. And uh, we hope in Hamilton uh, that we can have you down for the 10th time uh, to do an in-person uh, presentation in the new year. Um, the, Peter Sana asked me about the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. Well, briefly, we've been around since 2002. We were formed in the run-up uh, to stop the war on Iraq. And now it's uh, 2021. So 19 years later, and we haven't had to change the name because we lit there's always been a war, we live in a state of permanent war. And uh, the so your talk about the Canadian military is most relevant. But here I have the Hamilton spectator in front of me with a story. Uh, and uh, because it's in the spec, it must be true. And I'd like to ask your comment about it, Eve. Here it is. Feds to examine extremism in Canadian trained foreign troops. Ottawa, the Defense Department has vowed to review how the military screens for extremist views in the foreign troops it trains after a report found that far right radicals in the Ukrainian military boasted on social media that they had received training from the Canadian Armed Forces and took part in joint exercises. Do you have any comment on that, uh, Eve? Yeah, I mean, that's not new. That was obviously just reported on uh, yesterday or the day before. Canadian Press did a, a story on it. It's not new. Uh, we, I mean, we've known that the Canada has been supporting uh, far right forces in the Ukraine now, I mean, uh, decades, but, 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 but in the most recent form since 2014. Um, and uh, in 2018, it, the Canadian defense attache in, uh, in, uh, uh, Kiev uh, met with the Azov Battalion, uh, which is a far right uh, uh, group uh, in the Ukraine, uh, one of the most, I mean, depending on how you define it, arguably the, the best organized far right group in the world. Um, uh, and uh, so, so there, you know, there's a history there. I mean, they're, I don't, I wouldn't take them claiming that they're going to, you know, look into the matter uh, seriously because this has been policy. This is that's just public relations to try to, to try to, um, you know, I think if it, if we, if we made enough, made enough stink about it, and made enough, they would maybe, uh, you know, change some of their training methods. But, but they've been very bold on this. I mean, it's got to the point where they're, they, they refuse to support UN resolutions. Uh, condemning uh, 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 Nazism and Nazi identification, um, uh, they were actually voted for. They 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 were the, Canada was the only country, uh, only one of four or five countries: the U.S., Canada, Ukraine. I believe maybe there was a couple of those small islands that voted um, in favor of the uh, of the resolutions, and then the first the first one in uh, late. Uh, the first uh, uh, part of uh, Trudeau's mandate, it, Harper had had voted uh, against it as well, and then and, and Trudeau voted against it. I think in November 2015, and then subsequently they they've abstained. But these are resolutions that like 120, 130 countries vote for. The vast majority of of, of the UN members, um, and so they've been aligned in this policy in the Ukraine. Uh, uh, supporting far right policies. Uh, I, I, I've written about that uh, uh, in a few places. Uh, I mentioned it, I mentioned it in the book. It's, you know, training, this, this brings up a question of training, right? It's a, it's a fairly um, important part of Canadian military and foreign policy is training other countries militaries. Uh, uh, Ukraine is probably the most, one of the most politicized. Also in 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 in, in Iraq, um, part of the training in Iraq has been about training forces that that challenge um, that are 
that are you know, building up forces that are that are viewed as challenging Iranian influence within Iraq. So it's very politicized. I also mentioned the Palestine question, the West Bank, and the, the military training mission there. Um, but but uh, but yeah. So so with regards to right wing forces in the Ukraine, it's very unlikely it will, will change without a whole lot more uh, pressure on the issue. Thank you, Ken, for for that great comment. Uh, we, we have a we have a couple questions in the in the chat, so I'm just gonna uh, we have uh, two questions which are kind of related, so I'll, I'll I'll ask them together. We have one question from Larry Newfield: How long has Canada had a military presence in Israel? What's the justification for Canada having such a military presence in Israel? And Jenny Steinmeck asks. Is there any evidence that Canada helps Israel carry out naval patrols off the coast of Gaza? Well, the, the military presence is, is something called Operation Proteus. That, that's the presence in the West Bank. And what that is, uh, that goes back to, uh, that goes back to the, uh, the uh, in part to Hamas, winning the elections in 2006, the legislative elections. And, um, and basically the response of Israel and the, and the US was to try to instigate a civil war within Palestinian political life. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and so the, the Canada cut off its aid to the Palestinians uh, until there, there was a unity government with all the, almost all the Palestinian political factions that, that were uh, together, a unity government. They basically tried to break up, Israel and the US tried to break up the unity government. And, and, um, and so the, uh, the objective of Operation Proteus, uh, it had a, an element on that side, but the other side is that it's, it's about um, basically having a uh, occupation force in West Bank. So the Palestinian Authority is the subcontractor of Israel's occupation in the West Bank, that's been you know detailed in a whole bunch of places, and even the Canadian, the head of uh, CEDA, uh, former head of CEDA, Margaret Biggs, is an internal Canadian government document where she says that the point of the Canadian uh, uh, mission in the West Bank is to avoid uh, popular protest, uh, and that the Israel Israel was pressuring Canada to continue the training mission in the West Bank. At one point, the Harper government discussed getting rid of the training mission to put pressure on the Palestinian Authority around the UN statehood bid. Anyways, but, but, but so they, they, Israel's pressuring Canada to keep this, this, this training mission um, and, uh, and the, all the Palestinian uh, Authority uh, security officials are vetted by the Shin Bet, the internal Israeli intelligence. So, you know, it's kind of a unique, you know, throughout colonial history, the, you know, the British wanted Indian, different Indian forces to oversee their occupation. That, that you know, everywhere, in, in, you know, all throughout Africa, everywhere. They always use uh, indigenous forces to do as much of the security work as possible. What's unique about the situation of US, Canadian, British training in the West Bank is that it's, it's outsourced to other countries to do that same dynamic, to basically build a security force to oversee Israel's colonization of, 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 of the West Bank. Um, with regards to naval patrols in uh, off the coast in Gaza, there was uh, some reporting on that. I believe, like back in like 2008, I think I saw some story about that that talked about it. I haven't seen anything uh, uh, since then. My uh, guess would be that they're probably fairly limited. Um, you know, Palestinians in Gaza have very little. Uh, military means. Israel is more than strong enough to keep control of quite a, quite a small uh, uh, coastal strip, uh, uh, you know, water area, sea area uh, on its own. I don't think it needs that much help from, from, uh, from Canada, the Canadian Navy. I don't know how much role the U.S. has been involved. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Yves. Our next question uh, comes from Robert Wilde, uh, he's, he's, asked, he's asked two questions. The first question, uh, he'd like you to talk about military support for Canadian mining sector presence in Central and South America. And his next question is about uh, military, Canadian military presence in the high Arctic 
regarding the melting of sea ice and impending resource extraction by global corporations? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I, I can't say that there, there's um, direct um, evidence of the Canadian military engaging in Central America uh, to defend, to protect mining companies. What we definitely have, uh, what we definitely know is that in the 1970s and, and through the 80s, the Canadian military trained um, uh, in Jamaica uh, with the explicit intent of protecting uh, Alcan, which was then a Montreal based uh, company, their bauxite in Jamaica. And it was a, quite a big deal in Jamaica because these left wing uh, newspaper called a bang uh, criticized the, 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 uh, the Canadian military training taking place in Jamaica and said it was designed for this purpose of, 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 of uh, seizing uh, 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 Jamaican uh, resources, bauxite uh, or, or overthrowing a government. And, and it was dismissed at the time. But then uh, Sean Maloney, who's a well-known right-wing military historian, who teaches, I believe he still teaches at Royal Military College, he actually found, went to the internal government documents and found where the Canadian officials were said, said explicitly that that was the objective of, of, the, of the training missions over quite a, quite a, there was a series of, of training uh, uh, missions. Um, so there's no doubt that in the background of, uh, Canadian military policy in different countries. Like, you know, when Canadian troops were dispatched to Mali uh, recently, a lot of people speculated that, you know, there's very significant Canadian mining interests in, 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 uh, in Mali. And so I think that in, um, it's definitely, uh, uh, if you look at, you know, all of the ways in which the Canadian government supports the mining sector globally, from aid policy to diplomacy to trade commissioners uh, to investment accords, on and on and on. One of those elements in the background, I think, is military. Uh, I think it's probably usually uh, one step removed, um, but 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 uh, but there's definitely military policy definitely keeps that keeps the interests of Canadian mining companies uh, in mind. Uh, with regards to the, to the Arctic, um, the, the Canadian military is clearly, uh, you know, expanding uh, its role in the Arctic and sees, um, you know, the sort of the, the climate change and, and uh, greater, greater, um, uh, economic possibilities uh, that that has a uh, you know a strategic uh, uh, question um, uh, and uh, and oftentimes that's you know sort of indigenous um, uh, perspective is 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 largely excluded. There's a whole horrible history um, with with like the Dewey Line and uh, and. Uh, establishing uh, military outposts in the, in the far north um, and just incredible, um, first of all, complete like indifference to the, to the destruction, destruction of, of, uh, of local communities. Uh, and then also just incredible ecological damage that came along with, with setting up uh, the Dewey line and then the, 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 the mid, the mid, mid Atlantic line, I think it was called. Uh, uh, so uh, the military has this role in the far north alongside the U.S. military that's, um, that's quite um, anti-Indigenous and, and anti-ecological. Thank you, Eves. Our, our next comment comes from Ed Lehman of the Regina Peace Council. Ed, if you'd like to unmute, unmute your mic and ask, ask your, uh, and say your comments. Okay. Um, I'll... Uh, try to be brief part of my ner my uh, nervousness. I'm quite aware there's not much time left. Uh, first of all, I'd like to give a shout out to Tamara and B Bianca and Eves. I'm very, very happy with the work that you're doing. 
we need more younger people doing exactly what you're doing across the country. My big concern right now is that I think we need national efforts from coast to coast to coast. And I think the, um, that uh, when Parliament opens on November 22nd, we need a Canada-wide action um, right across the country. And we need uh, to, again, focus on the federal government. I know some people coming out of the election were feeling down, but there were some good things in the election. Three of the worst members of Parliament on the China file went down to defeat. And that was a, a good thing. Otherwise, I don't think too much changed. We're still facing a government that's committed to working hand in glove with the United States. And that includes the opposition parties. Although in many places, NDP candidates and Green Party's candidates did not agree with their leadership. And in Regina, I was very proud of the three uh, Green Party candidates who all took an anti-war position, and the NDP, some of the NDP candidates didn't have a deep understanding, but at least wanted to take a peace position, and and did as much as they understood. Um, and I think we have to keep up the pressure, especially on the opposition parties, but also. On the, on the liberals. And uh, we can't do that by dropping the political fight. The fight for peace is a political fight. And while some of us may believe in prayer and uh, mindfulness or other forms of, of activity, I think we, we have to continue to come together in a political fight with the government. We can't avoid that. And we can't give up on working in a united way from coast to coast to coast. And we have to continue to try and have appeals that can reach working people that are easy to understand and that discuss uh, social issues and economic issues as well. Uh, we can't just have peace be an academic question where the, you have to have a master's degree to understand what is being said. We have too many documents that are written in very difficult language. And I've got a, a degree myself. And if I can't make my way through a, a document, I don't expect uh, other people too either. Um, I'm really hoping that everybody will either organize a demonstration on November, November 22nd or during that week. So please, and appeal to your friends in Alberta and the other provinces where there have not been demonstrations. We have to find, and it doesn't take much, two or three people can stage a demonstration and have media contact. Okay, I think that's all I have, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed, for those very poignant comments. I guess we'll just do maybe one more question very quickly before we uh, wrap it up. Uh, Mark Haley has, ha has a question. Are there any vets for peace groups active in Canada? If so, what, uh, which groups are they? Uh, others on the, might might have better information than me. I don't believe there are. Uh, I have been people have reached out to me uh, um, wanting to uh, set up that type of uh, group, which I believe exists quite widely in the U.S. Um, but I don't I don't know um, where that's at. Okay, uh, we will now. Uh, 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 wrap up our event. I'll hand it over to uh, Tamara, who will uh, give uh, closing remarks and uh, make some uh, final uh, announcements.
just before I close, I noticed that Catherine Winkler from Nova Scotia has her um, has her camera on, and I think she made a comment in the the chat, and I didn't want to overlook it. So I, I, I wanted to know, Catherine, if you if you wanted to quickly make a, a comment or a question, and then uh, we'll close in the next three minutes. Um, did you have anything that you wanted to share, yeah, Catherine? Sure. Well, I really appreciate it. I know it's not intentional, but it is also really nice to hear women's voices in this form as in any form. And uh, so I appreciate that opportunity and I thank everyone for the discussion. I'm just curious if it would be possible strategically to uh, to promote a non-killing branch of uh, the war machine. Thank you. Did you have a quick reaction to that? Can we? Can we turn the Canadian Armed Forces and Department of National Defense into a non-killing machine? Um, and then we, we'll close in the next two minutes. I, I don't think so. I, I mean, I think the simple answer is I don't think so. I, I think I think it's, you know, it's it's theoretically possible to turn the Canadian military into a um, entity that tries to defend Canadian borders. But it has almost that has almost nothing to do with its roots as a uh, extension of British imperialism and trying to conquer the world. And then it's post World War Two roots, which are being uh, uh, an appendage of the US military and its efforts to to uh, to extend its power all around the world. The military leadership there's, a, there's one study that contrasts the Canadian Navy leadership's thinking, the former British navies that have a former British association. So uh, um, Australia, Canada, South Africa, Argentina, and India. And the Canadian and Australian, the, the other countries, they see themselves as, as naval forces in their region. The Canadian and Australian Navy, Navy leadership sees itself as part of a global power projection. And that's because they're, they totally associate with the, with the U.S. Navy. So, you know, theoretically, the, the Canadian Navy or Canadian military could be oriented towards, uh, uh, you know, just a defensive, uh, uh, but you know, in so many different ways from NORAD to NATO to a host of other accords the Canadian military has with the U.S. military, it's structured. The U.S. military can't go to war without the Canadian military probably providing some form of support, right? Be it just a couple staff officers helping out in NORAD or in, at the U.S. base in Tampa, Florida, uh, uh, or, you know, so, 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 um, I think that, uh, you know, argument, you know, and if you look at something like peacekeeping, right, if you really delve into what peacekeeping is, you know, can, Canadian peacekeeping forces in, in Haiti helped overthrow the government in 2004. Canadian peacekeeping forces in the Congo in the early 1960s helped assassinate President Lumumba. The mission in the, the war in Korea was actually a UN peacekeeping mission. So even peacekeeping is far more complicated than is just is generally uh, uh, presented. And the military itself doesn't really want to engage in peacekeeping. They want to engage in NATO and, and US-led wars. Um, so, so no, I, I think that the, the, it, 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 we need to fundamentally confront the military as being this violent uh, uh, institution that sucks up an incredible amount of public resources uh, that doesn't provide us with security, right? The real security threats are the climate crisis, the the pandemic, let alone all kinds of other industrial pollutants, uh, 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 you know, all kinds of other health health issues. Um, the military is structured to enable corporate profit, to enable Canada to participate in in uh, in NATO and uh, and uh, and imperialism. Uh, thanks, Eve. Uh, so thanks everyone very much for 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 coming. Uh, 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 
a big congrats to Eve on his important new book. We want to encourage you all to uh, to get a copy. Uh, Christmas is coming up. You can buy two copies and share it with a friend or a family member or uh, buy a copy for your member of parliament. I think Eve made a very important point that we do not have um, any elected official that are that are really pushing, asking the difficult questions, you know, critiquing the military, um, and uh, you know, we need allies in 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 Parliament. We need to push our MPs to uh, to take better uh, positions and to ask uh, uh, challenging questions to critique the military. This is so um, essential. And then just to uh, let you know about some upcoming events. Uh, this week is UN Disarmament Week. The Canadian Voice of Women for Peace has a campaign calling on the Canadian government to have an agenda for disarmament. This is actually a, a requirement and obligation under the United Nations that Canada has totally disregarded. Um, so please ask your new member of parliament uh, to take disarmament seriously. And, um, and to make the links between the climate crisis and military emissions and military expenditure with COP26 coming up. November 11th is, uh, is Remembrance Day and the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace for many years has been promoting the white poppies. If you want to remember, then work for peace. And so we encourage you to get your white poppy and to, to challenge uh, to challenge the, the the prevailing myth, the glorification of the military and war around November 11th by wearing your white poppy and to support and uh, supporting our campaign. Um, we also uh, want to let you know that we've got a webinar on November 4th about white poppies and uh, linking with with uh, people around the world who are working on the white poppy campaign. We've got Sandy Greenberg, who's going to be on that webinar November 4th. It's being organized by World Beyond War. And then as as um, has mentioned a couple on of times on this call, uh, we just wanna make a special appeal to everybody to participate in our week of action. November 22nd, when parliament resumes, uh, no new fighter jets. We're going to have a huge banner drop on Parliament Hill that first day. We are asking everybody to stand in front of the Member of Parliament office that week with a sign, no new fighter jets, deliver a letter and, and put pressure on the government not to go through with this procurement. The time is of the essence. This is very, very urgent. The decision is going to be made in the next three months and we absolutely must stop it. If we don't, friends, we will not be able to decarbonize and meet the Paris Agreement by 2030 or the UN Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. It will lock us into carbon intensive militarism for the next six decades. So it is absolutely critical that you get involved. And one way that you can do that is by joining the No Fighter Jets Coalition. We're having a meeting tomorrow and the Canada wide Peace and, and Justice Network. So thank you again, everyone very much for participating in this um, in this uh, book launch. We hope you have a a wonderful uh, rest of your Sunday and please continue to stay connected with the Canadian Voice of Women for Peace and the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute. We need your uh, involvement and we also could really use your financial support. So thank you very much friends. Peace and solidarity, love to you all. Bye, thanks Eve. Thank you, thank you Tamara, you're <laughs> a firecracker. <laughs> I hope your stuff is all in that email you sent out with all the dates. Yes, we will send it out. Thanks, everyone, so much. Nice to see you all. Mm -hmm.